Hi guys, welcome to the first uh, online lecture for attachment across the lifespan, um, Public Health 5007. And um, well, it looks like this is going to be the new world just for a little while while we're getting things looked at from the university's perspective. And um, I mean, I, I, uh, I hate this process, number one, because I think I look like a some sort of dick when I'm being recorded um, but also because I'm a, a performer I like to be in front of the class and to give you information so to have to you know record this um, is difficult so I know it's difficult for all of you um, let's just pray it's not going to be too long and we'll get this over and done with <coughs> I'm going to make a number of changes to the my uni uh, course webpage one is that we'll have a discussion board available every week so that when we're doing these lectures, if there's any information or discussion that you'd like to have with your fellow students, you can do so. I'd like lots of feedback about this um, as much as possible because, you know, um, it's not an easy um, process doing this and I want to make sure that you feel like you've had a decent recording and that you can see all of the information and um, you can hear me okay and all of those types of things um, although don't look too closely I can see huge bags under my eyes there this is absolutely terrible I feel about 80 mm, dear all right um, so yeah we'll do those things on my uni and hopefully uh, this will be a process that you'll get something out of and that we'll all be happy with how does that sound uh, of course you can email me uh, matthew.doherty at adelaide.edu.au anytime and um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions that way um, you can also uh, give me a call on uh, 0401 459 if you feel like you need any additional support there too uh, so today woohoo we're going to talk about attachment and effect regulation. And isn't that just topical at the moment, given that, uh, you know, we're living in a world at the moment where lots of people, I imagine, are having troubles effect regulating because really we are triggering everyone's primordial defense mechanisms at the moment, aren't we, in terms of everyone being worried or frightened or um, upset about this um, COVID-19 business. And, um, you know, so we're right in the thick of it in terms of having to deal with our emotions and process them. So it seems somewhat that this, this lecture is a little bit timely. Um, so as you can see here, uh, to my right, but your left, there you go, I'm a bit retarded from a spatial point of view. Um, you can see the different topics that we're going to cover today there on screen. I'm using this new Butte Prezi video uh, thing uh, to try it out because I'm up for new technologies and I want to see what it works like. And um, so uh, we'll go from there. Look, like I said, any problems, just let me know and um, we'll try and iron them out as best as we can. And I hope, I pray, <laughs> that I'll see you all back in class soon enough anyway. So let's get today started and let's talk about effect. This one up the top here, effect. This one, emotion. And that's basically what effect is. Um, you know, a um, bit of a wanky psychiatry word for emotion. Um, but, um, you know, uh, you would have heard me say before, all behavior is meaningful and can be explained. That's good old Hildegard pep play on the 50s. But what I would also say to that is that all emotion can be explained and understood. And emotions don't come out of nowhere. I don't know what the modern discourse is these days where we, we feel that, you know, we've got too much emotion, we try and get rid of it. We have got haven't got enough, we try and get rid of it. All of these varying states uh, of effect that we experience are a part of the human uh, phenomenology of, of being who we are, of being human. 
most importantly, and um, you know, remember going back to to Winnicott and Bowlby and Ainsworth and all of those guys who were big Darwinians. Back to the idea of evolution, they uh, all um, saw emotion as a way as as a way of driving connection with others, of bonding uh, with others. We need to evoke um, uh, emotion in the parent or the caregiver, otherwise they won't look after us uh, well enough. Um, and then the dinosaur will come into the cave and eat us. Um, and so, you know, we can see that um, emotion has this evolutionary context that's been driving our survival to a large extent as well. But emotion is present in pretty much everything we do. You know, it's been present in the beginning of my my uh, presentation today when I pray to you that we'd all be back together again soon. Um, it's present in your intimate relationships, in your relationships with your parents, in your relationship with your friends, your fellow students, you know, your workmates, wherever you go, emotion is a normal part of interacting with others. Um, pretty much most psychotherapeutic approaches refer to the importance of emotion. Uh, if we're thinking about the counselling or psychotherapeutic world, you know. So from the psychodynamic perspective, I think about emotion as driving unconscious content um, or being driven by unconscious content. Uh, I often think of um, emotion in the CBT context because, you know, we know that the way we think drives the way we behave, which drives the way that we feel or whatever that, however that triangle comes together. Even good old near enough, nice enough, not enough Carl Rogers spoke about emotion and said, really, we have to center ourselves in others. We have to emotionally connect in order to understand others. And um, so, <clears throat> you know, we can't deny the importance of emotion. It's, it's, it's really a central part of most of what we do as therapists. Um, but if we take those same therapeutic frameworks, again, that have said that emotion's important, they're also saying as well that um, when we're not regulating emotions well, that's equaling some form of pathology, um, psychopathology. And that's usually what we work with in the context of being a therapist, uh, is some form of uh, emotional dysregulation or emotional pathway that someone's seeking support with. Um, I love the fact that Shaw here says, you know, it's true that all of our problems uh, deal, you know, come from relationships mostly. They, they occur in relationships. Even if the actual etiology of the problem wasn't in the relationship, that is, you know, a log fell off the tree and busted your leg, um, how others deal with you afterwards is so important in terms of that experience and um, you know you ex dealing with your pain and uh, others helping you to deal with it and encapsulating that experience not becoming traumatized by it etc etc um, so we are hurt in relationship this is what Shaw says we're hurt in relationship so therefore we must be healed in relationship it makes absolute sense doesn't it hurt in relationship must be healed in relationship and that's why attachment in a nutshell is so important to us because it helps us to regulate our effect and offer uh, a emotional position that we can give to others that will uh, help them to grow their own sense of self and their own understanding uh, of their both the internal and the external world and that's a wonderful thing so if we think about effect regulation, you know, I've got this slide here that um, is, is uh, naming this in a more sort of formal way for you. What is effect regulation? And you can see that Eisenberg here says some key things. It is initiating, maintaining, modulating or changing the occurrence, intensity or duration of internal feeling states and emotion related psychological processes. Or physiological processes so Eisenberg goes on to say here it's achieved through effortful management so that is that you know we don't just manage our emotions out of nowhere effortful management it takes some pain uh, and some difficulty in dealing with our emotions and that also involves how we think about them and what we do with them from the cognitive perspective 
And if we tie that one step back again, we're talking about neurophysiological processes here. So effect is not a simple concept. Um, it is present in um, our sense of self, it's present in our relationship with others, it's present in our um, physiology, it's present in our cognition, and it's in present in our brain, in our neurophysiology. And, um, you know, that makes it quite an astounding concept within itself. And so, you know, um, it's particularly astounding when you stop to think about how we are learned to affect regulate at all, you know, what, what that process is. Um, but, you know, here's effect regulation. It is all of these things that Eisenberg is saying, uh, and um, we're going to dig at that a little bit deeper. I just wanted to go to the other, the flip side of the coin there, because if we talk about effect regulation, we have to talk about effect dysregulation, and because that's that's the bread and butter of our work, really, as as therapists, um, we're always working with some form of effect dysregulation in the room, uh, or in the experience of others, and so if we take that, if we read the opposite to what Eisenberg is saying about effect regulation, then we can see very clearly that it's an inability to regulate and modulate and integrate um, reflective experiences about uh, our emotions, about our effect, um, and to adequately communicate that to others, but not just others, to ourselves as well. Um, which is, you know, what leads to um, issues with effect, why we go numb, why we disassociate, all of those types of things. Um, when we're talking about attachment, we see effect regulation present in a number of ways, or dysregulation present in a number of ways, particularly when we're talking about insecure attachment. So when we get um, someone who's insecurely attached, they're either over-regulating um, their um, effect or they're under regulating um, their effect so um, if we think about um, someone who's avoidant um, they often um, try to be numb um, or inhibited um, that they don't want to look at their emotions well um, they have difficulty verbalizing those they stay away from others um, because they don't want to get involved in effective content um, and so, you know, they um, over-regulate um, emotional content as much as possible to make sure that it doesn't spill out into a space that they can't deal with. When we're talking about more of the ambivalent attachment side of things, we're talking about under-regulation because these individuals are underwhelmed, uh, are overwhelmed, sorry, by their emotional state. Um, they are uh, easily overly aroused. You know, they're always seeking uh, that love that's not consistent. And so that makes them Im impulsive. Um, it makes them clingy. It makes them, um, you know, want to um, share uh, of themselves with others in inappropriate ways. Um, and so for the most part, they're under, under regulating their effect. They're letting it go all over the place um, and um, not allowing it to... Um, not allowing any cognitive and um, other psychological processes to occur that allow them to to keep a lid on that. Um, so you know, there's two very real uh, examples of where we can see effect dysregulation um, in relation to attachment, when we're overregulating um, with someone who's uh, avoidant, and where we're underregulating where we've got someone who's ambivalent. So let's go into back into the beginning because we always talk about these 1,000 days of life, don't we, uh, in class? And I think it's really important that, that those 1,000 days, um, when we're considering those, that we look at that in relation to effect regulation because that is where baby or infant, and remember Winnicott said there is no such thing as just baby, 
it's only baby and mother or caregiver and parent. And that is so true in terms of effect uh, regulation um, because the child is dependent, uh, you know, for the, in those early years for the parent to be able to hold effective content for them, contain that, process it, attune to it so that the child is becoming understood. Um, the child is seeing that they have some resilience. They're seeing that they've got some ability to hold on to effective content. Uh, and then it's handed back to the child slowly more and more as the child develops so that they become more autonomous at that, that in that process as they're going. So you can see the wonky in internal working models that happen when we get infants who are having very insecure attachments because they're not having um, a parent or a caregiver who is effectively holding and containing their effective experience. They're only getting, uh, you know, half of the picture often or a very discordant picture of what effect regulation looks like. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a co-regulatory process, um, not just even to start with, actually, we could argue, but all through uh, life, you know, we're constantly looking um, towards others to help us co-regulate our effect. But particularly in those first 1,000 days of life, we are looking for the, um, you know, the caregiver or the parent to, to regulate our levels of arousal, to, to regulate um, our negative and our positive um, uh, affects and, um, you know, helping us to explore the world and helping us to develop a sense of identity. And we'll talk some more about that in a minute too, because the sense of self and the development of our effect regulation uh, are intricately tied together. How are you going there? I'm not um, talking to you too much, talking at you. I know what to do. You can't ask me questions at the moment. Um, could stop and have a cup of tea. No? All right. We'll keep going. Let's talk about the good enough parent. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Winnicott. We talked about how Winnicott said there was the good enough parent and this was the parent who is able to put the lens of the baby on so that they can see the world through the baby's eyes and they can get a clear understanding of what the baby, how their baby is experiencing the world or at least they're trying hard to do that. They're trying their best to attune with the child in such a way as that, you know, they're aligned with the child in a meaningful way. And so that interactive good enough, good enough parent or caregiver will, you know, will attune and reattune with the child all, all of the time. Um, they'll always be seeking to interpret the, the child's effective content through the eyes of the child, through trying to understand what the world looks like uh, for the child and then holding on to effective states that might be too negative or might be too great for them and containing that and saying, that's okay, I can hold on to that for a little while. And um, so you don't have to, um, you know, become over uh, aroused by that because it's the first time you've experienced it perhaps and you don't know what it's like to experience that and um, so I'm just going to hold you in that process as much as, as possible and when we come to an understanding together where we've sort of figured that out and that's going to be through me talking to you to the child it's going to be the way I hold the child the way I soothe them my non-verbals it's going to be my right brain alignment, um, it's going to be a neurobiological process, all of these types of things. And I'm handing that all back to the child in a processed and um, meaningful way, you know. Uh, and so that um, I've amplified the experience of the child and the child then has some fundamental building blocks to be able to express their emotions, to, to understand them and um, to know what to do with them when they, they come over them. And as I said, that becomes more and more autonomous as we get older. Um, and that's really important. Uh, not that we ever get rid of it. Like I said, we still always need help in some way to 
regulate R effect. So let's have a look at the sense of self. I said before that effect is really tied to the sense of self and that's that's very true and certainly the, the current research is showing us uh, that more and more, um, particularly the right uh, hemisphere, the role that that's playing um, in, the, in the frontal region of the brain. Remember we had a good look at the brain model when we did the neurobiology of attachment last week before we were all banished uh, off to our homes. Um, and you can see here what Feinberg and Keenan say, the right hemisphere, particularly the right frontal region under normal circumstances, plays a crucial role in establishing the appropriate relationship between the self and the world. So dysfunction results when we get a two-way disturbance of that personal relatedness between the self and the environment that can lead to disorders of both under and over relatedness between the self and the world under an overregulation, as we were talking about before. So, um, and we are putting this into practice in therapy. This is what we're doing all the time. It is the development of the sense of self when we're repairing uh, attachment issues and we're trying to teach people to affect regulate. It's this sense of self that we're, we're growing uh, all the time. The, the adult, um, it doesn't matter if it's the infant or, you know, it's the adult that's got this um, attachment injury from uh, earlier on in their life. They're looking for ways to be able to develop um, enough sense of their internal world to understand what's going on inside them as best as they possibly can. And, you know, they have to do that in a relational space. That, that's the way that the child does it. It can't be done by, by oneself. Um, and um, it's, it's through uh, those relationships that we start to develop our sense of self, that we start to understand what we're capable of, uh, who we are, um, you know, what uh, effect we can hold and what effect we can't hold. Or have difficulty in holding. So this rather lovely cycle that you can see on the screen here now is um, a cycle that I put together to show you what, just to show you what that normal regulation looks like. So you can see at the top um, of our um, cycle here now above baby's head, we, we have the notion of touch, voice, gaze, intonation, attention, response. This is mum feeding or the caregiver or the parent feeding into the baby information about their effect and about what's um, what's occurring inside of them. Um, this is the the, the, the the containing part where, um, you know, mum says, well, I'm holding this for you and at the moment I'm helping you to, to make sense of that and I'm going to do that through all of this beautiful prefrontal cortex um, space and through all of these things like touch and voice and etc. And so the right brain gets switched on and it starts to grow. And we know that the right brain is linked to the development of self. And so the child starts to understand more about themselves because they're getting all of this good uh, right hemisphere development that's saying to them, uh, yes, you're, you're resilient, you're lovable. Um, it is possible for you to contain um, positive and negative effects when they come and you'll... Um, you know, you'll be able to um, deal with that in a healthy way. Um, and so um, the child then starts to take that on more and more and more. You know, they're autonomously doing doing this. You know, they know what it's like uh, to be happy. They know that um, what it's like to be sad. They know what it's like to be angry, etc., etc. And they can start to figure out some of this um, effect in a in a more complex way and hold on to it themselves with all of this good containment and holding that the parents given. Um, in that way, mum also starts to understand the baby and the baby sees more of itself in the mother in that process. And this is mum becomes, or the caregiver becomes more and more attuned to that process. Uh, and, um, you know, so this good enough parent who's viewing the world through um, baby's eyes is able to say, Oh yeah, well, you know, um, I'm attuned to you. I know what this affective state is that you're in at the moment and 
um, you know, um, I've a whole, helped you to hold that before and we've contained it and we've looked at it. And um, now I'm, I'm quite aligned with you in terms of what you're doing with that. And, um, and so, um, you know, the, 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 the child feels very held and very secure in that, in that position, knowing that, um, that the world is understanding of them and that, um, you know, that, they, that um, someone's seeking to align um, <clears throat> the child's subjective experience with their own. Um, and then, you know, we get, again, we get solid interaction between the parent and, uh, or the caregiver and the, and the child. Um, but if we stop to think about what, so we've looked at uh, effect regulation, effect dysregulation, what does the cycle look like now when it's dysregulated um, and when we've got insecure attachment and um, the child's trying to understand their effect, they start to get quite a deficit in their right uh, hemisphere development. Uh, and, you know, the internal working model that we've talked a lot about uh, already in this course starts to go a bit wonky. So um, this is not someone who's had much containment or holding, uh, or if they had, it's come with a particular message that's not helpful. Um, they might have, um, you know, um, in, insecure attachment again. Remember, they might have stories of, of um, you know, someone not being consistently there to hold their effect. Um, if they've been in a uh, disorganized attachment pattern, then someone actually may have been quite frightening to them in terms of holding their effect. Um, and so there's all this over or under regulation that's occurring. And because of that, then uh, mum and baby tend to dysregulate with each other quite significantly. And, um, you know, there never seems to be a clear alignment between the child's effective state and the, and the effective state of the mother. Uh, or the you know the holding and containing state of the mother uh, and so we get this dysregulated individual who again whose sense of self is not as strong as as it could be because um, you know they're not they're not getting a message about their robustness and their resilience and and their lovability um, you know they're getting other messages that that are saying um, far more coercive things to them than and the good things that we see in secure attachment. Remember the story I shared with you when I had um, the mother who uh, may or may not have shared this with you, but I think I did. Mum went and put her kid in the green bin uh, I was working with. She came in to see me. She said, I've just put my baby in the green bin. And um, she did take it out. It was safe. Don't worry about that. But she was definitely in this cycle of dysregulation. You know, there was very insecure attachment going on between the mother and the baby and the more the baby cried the less mum was attuned with the baby's effective needs and responses she couldn't contain that she couldn't hold it uh, and so then the child just gets uh, a message that the world is effectively a messy scary place you know no one's going to be able to hold on to uh, my emotions for me at any great length So what does this all mean? I mean, if we're working therapeutically with someone and we're talking about trying to teach them some way to affect regulate uh, in terms of their attachment needs, it's all about the relationship. Yeah, we've, I've said this to you over and over and over again, haven't I? Are you listening now? All about the relationship. Yes, because Remember, right at the beginning of this lecture, I said to you, we injure in relationship, but we heal in relationship. Individuals that have um, a poor ability to affect regulate through their attachment experiences need to have new experiences that say to them, this is the way it can be. This is the way that is possible. You are resilient. You are lovable. Um, you know, um, sure and sure, so importantly say here that, um, you know, this is about uh, the, re the therapeutic relationship is, is about um, repairing in the internal working model of the self um, for these individuals, you know, um, and that's a very communicative and intersubjective or interactive process, you know, there's lots of intersubjectivity that goes into that. 
uh, and it, it's allowing um, an individual really to become attached with you in a secure way that is meaningful uh, for them um, in, in terms of developing their own sense of self and their own ability to hold on to their own emotions. So, Dessetti and Shamanad here, I think I put this quote because I think, again, I think it's quite poignant. Mental states that are in essence private to the self may be shared between individuals. Self-awareness, empathy, identification with others and more generally intersubjective processes are largely dependent upon right hemisphere resources, which are the first to develop. You know, so um, again, uh, what Dissetti and Shamanad are saying here is that it, it's the sharing process that's most important. Um, you know, otherwise, uh, as they point out, the, this, this is otherwise uh, states that might be private to the self. And that's one of the issues in working with someone that doesn't, that can't affect regulate well or that's got attachment issues. It's because they have, um, you know, a, an internal world um, that's telling them all of this content that, that, that may or may not be healthy uh, about how they can hold on to things or hold on to their emotions or understand their, their world and their, their sense of self. And they don't share it with others because it's an internal process, you know. And they, the irony of that is that they weren't given the skill set to be able to share it with others in the first place. So that's your job. That's your job as a therapist. You've got to be there and you've got to be the one who's role modeling and doing this as much as possible in the therapeutic relationship. So how do we repair? How do we repair regulation of effect in um, therapy? And it's, so we know, I've already said it's embedded in the relationship with your client. That's really, really important. And it's a, more about what you do than what you say, actually. Um, if, if we look at the literature and I can say this from, from practice, you know, um, that there's a lot of um, non-verbal, um, subtle um, variation and expression, um, posture and movement that goes into showing secure attachment. Just as the baby is held in a loving and secure way, you know, when the good enough mother comes and, and strokes the baby and touches the baby and reassures the baby that's in an effective state. Uh, obviously, we can't do that with our clients. So there are some therapies that do that, but I wouldn't recommend them. Um, we are looking um, to replicate that in our own sense uh, of self um, when we're present uh, with the individual. And so, you know, everything that uh, a whole set of being, a whole right brain process is beaming across the room into this individual and giving them a clear message um, that we're empathic, that we are very explicitly attending to everything that they have to say, um, that they're being heard um, and that we are not pathologizing that in any way, that we are... Um, you know, listening for the subjective experience and that we are contained, that we're, we're offering to hold what they can't hold and contain that for a while, to put that into our vessel and to mull it over, to process it, you know. One might say to turn the water into wine might be a nice uh, example. Um, but that's what we're doing. We are really pushing that agenda um, in in... Uh, teaching effect regulation. It's not all about, here's the worksheet, yes, this is what a happy face looks like, this is what a sad face looks like, etc., etc. In fact, there's far more nuanced embedded behaviours in the therapeutic relationship that pay greater homage to the idea of effect regulation or helping others to effect regulate than, um, than the, the, those other processes that we've just talked about. So interestingly, you know, you can, we say here it's a two-way street because it's not actually just, um, you know, the client that's that's um, present in the room for this to occur. It's you um, and, you know, uh, everything that you're offering, you offer as an interpretation 
um, to back to the client and and just as the client interprets what you do you're interpreting what the client does so there's a very reciprocal process that's going on here you know we're looking for cues from our client that something effectively may not be right you know um, we're looking for cues of secure uh, attachment that the, 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 the client's understanding that there's some form of secure attachment process that's going on um, and um, you know that they're processing that in a in a, in a beneficial way um, and you know that's often without the addition of words we don't have to say anything often in that regard um, this is going back to the Rogerian idea of, of just being able to be empathic and um, congruent um, and, and this is what we mean by holding uh, more than anything you know just being present in the effective state and not doing anything that's um, pathological with that you know um, not expecting anything in return, you know. Uh, there's a great Jungian therapist who refers to this process as cherishment, and and I think it's a really nice name. Um, you know, cherishment is the idea that we unconditionally love our client. We're not looking for unconditional love back, um, but in a sense, that's what secure attachment is. It's a form of unconditional love. Uh, and um, so we're offering that. Um, to the client in terms of our presence and um, in terms of our physicality as well as our psychological space. It's complex, isn't it? So establishing the therapeutic alliance is a must and I mean I can't stress that enough. We already know from the literature that the therapeutic alliance is um, pretty much just about everything i mean we talk about the common factors of therapy uh, but even the therapeutic alliance is 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 matching those um, you know we um, are just beginning to understand that the nature of the relationship is so important in the therapeutic process um, and particularly if you've had someone that's got an insecure history you know, it just goes without saying, doesn't it, that if, if you get onto the wrong foot with that client in terms of the therapeutic rapport or alliance and they've already got some sort of insecure injury to their attachment, they're not going to give you much of a second chance, you know. They're, they're, they're going to be looking for cues or as many cues as possible in the relationship uh, that you're offering something that's very real and that's very consistent and um, very secure to them. Um, and so, you know, we have to, as therapists, we have to focus as much as possible when we are trying to teach someone to affect, regulate and come out of attachment injuries. Uh, you know, we have to focus on relationships so much. I can't stress that enough. And let me say, that's not always easy because, of course, people who have attachment issues are often... The individuals who are not looking for, well, they might be looking for security in a, in a relationship without knowing it. But the other thing is they're acutely hypervigilant for a relationship that's going to prove that their internal working model is right. And so from that perspective, um, working with clients like that can be very, very difficult. It is not easy to say the least. Uh, and sometimes you have to be very patient and very persistent um and you know you have to be really nuanced in terms of what you're doing um for the care of those 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 clients um because it is so easy at times too to rupture the therapeutic alliance um and it even but, but ruptures are important we'll talk more about ruptures in the therapeutic alliance in in relation to attachment um in coming lectures but um you know it, it, the nature of, of the beast is that, you know, working with big attachment issues is, is difficult. So, so I've sort of, I've talked at you for 40 minutes in this, this video, and I think that's enough for anyone. I think you must be going brain dead by now. Um, what did I really want to say in summary? You know, your take home messages in terms of effect regulation and attachment are these. 
we learn to affect regulate through relationship that is how we do it in a secure relationship we get lots of good achievement and lots of information given back to us that says that we can understand our effect that someone's contained and held that for us helped us to process it and that they've given it back to us in a form that's digestible and understandable for us and that we can then become more autonomous in understanding our mood as we go along for those that have had the insecure uh, attachment experience they're not necessarily getting that same message in terms of regulating their effect. They're getting told that they're, you know, potentially they're not lovable or, um, you know, the caregiver's frightening or um, just not available to them all the time. And so they start to uh, have all sorts of problems in regulating th their effect because they simply haven't had anyone to help them understand it in a meaningful way. Our role of the therapist, therefore, is to be that secure attachment and that within itself offers the effect regulatory process um, to be repaired basically um, and so um, it, it's in the relationship that we help others to understand their effect that again we come to this process process of containing and holding uh, what's in the therapeutic space and so that you know the in the end the client is having secure relationship model to them uh, and they're breaking that down into into understandable and digestible chunks for them um, to help them understand their effect and help them to change their internal working model towards believing that they can hold on to that and do it in a good way this last quote here from Whitehead I think is very poignant and so I'll read that to you and I'll leave um, that with you um, today have a look at the the readings that are on my uni um, as I said I'll put the discussion board up uh, and um, yeah any feedback about how this has gone and whether you need anything more then I really appreciate that every time we make therapeutic contact with our patients we are engaging profound processes that tap into essential life forces in ourselves and in those we work with Emotions are deepened in intensity and sustained in time when they are intersubjectively shared. This occurs at moments of deep contact. Okay guys, take care and I'll talk soon. Bye.